Hi, my name is Sarah Monero. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to play a bit part in the establishment of the United States Space Force and the reestablishment of the United States Space Command. I was the staff director for the Strategic Forces Subcommittee in the House of Representatives in both the majority and the minority. I now happily serve as a senior defense fellow with the Center for New American Security, where I focus on space and strategic forces issues. Let me say thank you to the Secure World Foundation for having me to talk a little bit about Space Force, how it happened, and where it can go in the future. Let me first recognize that the call for an independent Space Force really started around 20 years ago with senators like Bob Smith from New Hampshire, the 31st Marine Corps Commandant, General Chuck Kruliak, as well as the, at the time, the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. It wasn't until almost 20 years of reform and reorganization had occurred that Congress started to believe that these challenges were so big that the executive branch was not capable of fixing them on their own, which is where Representative Mike Rogers of Alabama and Jim Cooper of Tennessee enter the scene in 2017. The gentleman asked a pretty simple oversight question. Who's in charge of DOD military space? And instead of getting a simple answer, what they got back was a labyrinthian chart with over 60 different organizations, all of whom were able to say no to a specific space acquisition, but none of whom were responsible and authorized to say yes. Over the next couple of years, with the help of individually motivated senators and the executive branch, the reasons for developing a space force started to really crystallize and there were four of them. The first was really resourcing. In a resource constrained environment, who was advocating for space unique budgets? And if a tough choice needed to be made between an air breathing platform and a space system, how was that going to be made? The second was really about requirements and acquisition. With the rise of threats to our space assets, coupled with the innovation and the potential that's coming out of the commercial sector are the processes that the DOD uses for defining requirements and for buying and purchasing and developing satellite systems adequate to be able to address these concerns in a quick and responsive manner. The third was really about culture, about cadre development. You know, who wakes up in the morning and thinks solely about space operators? How are they trained? What is their career progression? What is their opportunity for growth? And how will that be fostered into the future? And lastly, with the recognition that space was a war fighting domain, how did this fundamentally change how terrestrial operations would be executed and how future war fighting concepts would be developed? Space Force is still less than two years old. They've made consistent progress in addressing all four of these issues, and I anticipate that they will continue to do so. In general, I think Space Force would be well served by going back and looking at those first four issues or challenges that were identified by Congress in the establishment of Space Force and the reestablishment of Space Command. I think they need to build honest and transparent relationships with their oversight committees and have the courage to shape their own destiny. And this is important because it's not just some science fiction kind of trope. It's about recognizing that Space Force has the opportunity not only to make history, but to shape the future. And it does this by prioritizing space resources, by choosing winners in the private sector, by making big bets on advanced technology, and by challenging legacy architectures that have been with us since the Cold War. In this way, Space Force gets to define itself in other ways the services only wish they could. At the same time, let's recognize that Space Force will encounter challenges. Let's be honest, all of the Space Force leadership prior to 2020 was Air Force leadership. And so as an individual, it's now up to them 
who were raised in Air Force culture to navigate these challenging incremental, incremental steps towards independence. Let's recognize how personally and professionally challenging that will be for them. Nonetheless, it is their responsibility, not only to change how they were taught to think about space, but to make demonstrably different decisions about how they acquire and operate space systems. I'm really loath to talk and perpetuate Star Trek references when talking about Space Force, and I've been counseled plenty of times not to do it. Um, I'm actually going to kind of open the, the aperture a little bit here. If I had to give guiding advice to the Space Force, I would probably quote um, Mae Jemison, one of our NASA astronauts, never limit yourself because of others' limited imagination. Never limit others because of your limited imagination. Thanks for having me, and I hope you have a wonderful conference. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Whedon. I'm the Director of Program Planning for the Secure World Foundation. As Sarah discussed in her Spotlight talk, the creation of the Space Force was the continuation of a long-running debate on how the US military should approach its activities in the space domain. Part of that debate has been, what is the role of the US military in space? Is it primarily to create capabilities that support and enhance terrestrial operations? Or should there be more of a focus on in-space activities and capabilities to suit missions in space? Today, we're gonna to have a panel that's gonna unpack all that issue, but before we get started, we wanna make sure we get some of your thoughts on this issue. As Crystal mentioned, there's a poll running over at Mentimeter. We're gonna be wrapping up in just a minute here uh, where you can add your opinion on this question. While you're finishing up filling out that poll, uh, let me go ahead and introduce my speakers for this panel. First, we have Colonel Casey Beard, who is commander of Delta Nine of Space Operations Command of the US Space Force, which focuses on orbital warfare. Prior to that, he was Deputy Director of Space Strategy and Plans Directorate in the Office of Secretary of Defense. We also have Dr. Bledon Bowen. He's a lecturer in international relations at the University of Leicester, and he's an expert on space warfare, international relations in outer space, and strategic theory. We also have Ms. Caitlin Johnson, who is the Deputy Director of the Aerospace Security Project at the Center for Strategic International Studies, and one of the editors of their annual Space Threat Assessment Report. And finally, we have Dr. Mir Sadat, who is the founding editor-in-chief of the Space Force Journal and a former director on the National Security Council, as well as a prior intelligence and space officer with the US Navy. Their full bios are on the website, um, and I welcome all four of you to our panel today. So as Sarah mentioned, the creation of the Space Force involved multiple different problems that were trying to be solved. How do we deal with the proper resourcing of the US military space activities? How do we reform and update the acquisitions process and creating requirements for military space activities? How do we create a professional space culture and cadre uh, and sort of break away from that air-focused mindset that Sarah mentioned? But what we want to talk about and kind of focus on in this panel is the thing she mentioned at the end about imagination and how that affects how we think about space activities. And it really gets to this core question of what does the future of space activities look like? How should the US military be using space? And are we going to, is it going to continue to have this focus on space to support terrestrial operations? Or is that focus going to shift towards more of an in-space? Before we get to the discussion, can we go ahead and show the results uh, from the audience poll? So very interesting, uh, at least to me, uh, that we have two thirds of the audience thinks that the focus should probably shift towards you know, developing these new missions and capabilities towards an in-space activity. Uh, that, that, that's pretty interesting. It was actually, I was expecting a little bit more 50-50, uh, but that, that's quite interesting. So now let's go back to the discussion. Um, Caitlin Johnson, I, I'd like to start with you. We heard Sarah talk about the role of the military as being a driver for the Space Force. Can you sort of expand on this? What was that historical debate about the role of the military in space 
and, and why was it important? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Brian, and the Secure World Foundation. It's always um, just an incredible pleasure to talk with you guys and with this awesome panel. I'm really excited for the discussion. Sarah, as always, was brilliant in her spotlight talk, and I think really laid out the foundations of why the Space Force was created and what the debate in Congress was like. Um, as she mentioned, it was it was not new, um, and the the debate of what and how the military should operate in space is, is also not new um, and has been ongoing um, really since the start of the space age and the launch of Sputnik. Um, so we're really talking about, you know, who will advocate and own space, who will determine what the missions are and what those missions will be. Um, often this is talked about, you know, in concepts of war fighting for, um, the layman's terms, the way I kind of think about it without military jargon is um, su the supporting or the leading mission in space. And I don't necessarily believe that one is better than the others. And I know that my colleagues Mir and Levin have written on this extensively. So I'm very excited to see what what their perspectives are and how they um, you know, articulate those. But the, the debate has always been, you know, while space provides an incredible supporting uh, infrastructure for the U.S. military through communications, through command and control of our nuclear forces, um, intelligence gathering through ISR and remote sensing, we're really seeing um, this debate pick up and a, a, a new focus on and, and partially, I think, driven by the Space Force and Space Command establishment of is this the right mission that we should be focusing on or should we start shifting towards whatever these future missions are? And we often see people talk about this is lunar space as um, providing incredible national security advantage um, and how to start uh, developing missions there. And so I think right now within the department, we have a couple of different camps, um, not just new versus old, but also, um, you know, where should we, where should the Space Force and Space Command really start focusing their efforts and planning for future systems? Because as we know, space systems take a long time to work, acquire and develop and launch. So we have to start thinking about this now. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. That's an excellent point. Um, so, so Bledin, she's already said that up great. I'm going to turn to you. This is not the first time this question of what is the purpose of military space force has been posed. Can you give us a quick summary of sort of the history of how that debate has played out? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, and th thanks very much uh, for the invitation to be here today and uh, congratulations uh, on a great summit. Um, yeah, so so uh, a great introduction by um, Sarah Monero there as well to, and background uh, on this. And uh, the, the debate and the conversation within the US Air Force goes back far more than 20 years, arguably the idea of a space core or a space force um, or anything that's sort of more independent as as a space entity within the DOD goes back to arguably um, uh, the start of the US Air Force itself, um, but definitely by the late 1950s when military space activities and applications were certainly going to be a thing, especially um, after 1956 or so. So those ideas have been um, running around in, the, in various corridors of the DoD for a very, very long time, and they ebb and flow. And the US Air Force traditionally faced lot, um, a few uh, push and pull and, and tensions um, in this because, of course, as any bureaucratic entity, it enjoyed the budget that, that came with space. So um, more budget means usually more influence. So it wanted to keep hold of, of, of the space budget. And the Army and the Navy did try to compete to keep their various uh, space budgets and activities in, in the 1950s, but eventually lost out to the intelligence agencies, NASA and the the US Air Force. Um, so as well as keeping the budget, it had to make sure that it didn't neglect space too much, uh, otherwise Congress would take space off of it. But also if it did space too well, arguably it, uh, it would create enough of a subculture and bureaucracy within the Air Force that would then spin off into a more separate organization, which is arguably now what has happened. But due to political intervention from um, the former president, Donald Trump, which jumped on the pre-existing bipartisan drive that was already in the works, as, as we already heard from, from Sarah. So those general arguments of a culture 
really have been pretty consistent and um there was some headway of course in the 1980s after the gold water nickels act which um provided a bit more operational coherence within the us air force with regard to space and more joined up military planning and execution of operations um within um strategic command and um uh, us uh, space force command as well so a lot of these old structures are being resuscitated um and also brings things back that were ended under the George W. Bush uh, administration as well. So there's a lot of old bureaucracy and arguments that are now taking part in slightly different bureaucratic settings with the Space Force. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so Mir, you were serving on the National Security Council while the most recent iteration of this debate was unfolding. How did it play out there? What were some of the changing geopolitical dynamics and space domain, domain dynamics that you saw playing into this? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you so much, Brian, for the invitation and Secure World uh, Foundation for hosting this event. Uh, I'm extremely uh, humbled to be on such a great panel with everybody. Uh, just first of all, um, I'm speaking in my personal capacity and uh, representing myself, not the U.S. government or any of its uh, agencies, departments or services. Um, and the perspective is a national security perspective, right? So um, one of the things that uh, I was very keen on uh, after uh, the new administration took off to see how their po major policy, which I would consider as the China policy, plays out. Uh, and we see that is very much an extension of the previous administration's uh, policies. Of course, there are uh, the means of which those policies get enacted, uh, maybe, uh, and are probably very different. Uh, one of the things that um, th the last administration faced was turning the tide on China. Uh, and what I mean by that was, a lot of turning of the Nelson's eye on what China is doing. A lot of um, they have us uh, uh, in a unit strategic location where we can't, they backed us into a corner. Uh, we didn't have that problem with Russia because our supply chain was independent of any Russian production or means of uh, supply. And so that that is interesting. And it's interesting to see how uh, in Congress we see a bipartisan movement to see uh, how we can uh, get China to start playing along with everybody and start appreciating the sort of the rules of the road, some of the international systems, norms and values that have been guiding our uh, system for about 80 years or so. And then <clears throat> the, the primary drive uh, for the uh, White House um, has been, and I think will be, is to ensure that the United States and our allies and partners around the world, those who believe in uh, democratic norms and values, ethical practices and business, financial transparency and, you know, not polluting the environment uh, and, and staying within bounds. I think th those are the ones that will live on, um, that, that we will also lead in space, you know, and I think the single best long-term initiative that the Biden administration and Congress can undertake is to really address uh, China's ever ambitious revisionist aspirations. Uh, and really, uh, the Biden administration has an opportunity to, to take something out of the Kennedy Johnson playbook and go all in, sort of what Sarah mentioned earlier in American space development. And I think that is um, something that is very important. The one piece that I think the last administration just couldn't get to it um, is uh, Artemis program. The Artemis program is not NASA's program. It's the program of the United States of America. It's the United States Artemis program. And so that is an important piece. Uh, if we don't understand the full spectrum of space power, right, then we find ourselves following the next century leaders. And uh, Artemis is part of space power and thus the calculation of national security involves it um, because our, our adversaries and nations that don't consider us as friends have integrated their national security, commercial and civil uh, seamlessly. And so the question is, do we want to lead in space or not? Uh, and or do we want other nations to lead and we follow them? And that's fine if we if we want to do that. And so I think that is some of the discussions that we had in the White House without getting into specifics of it. But that was what the, th the themes were. And I'm, I'm assuming that that will be the themes as we see uh, in the media and in some of the statements being played out right now in the uh, interagency meetings. And of course, every agency has their particular perspective. Uh, and so that is going to be negotiated. Great, thank you. Um, so, Colonel Bird, I want to turn to you now. Um, you were also on the ground floor of some of the discussions, both within the Air Force and your time with the Secretary of Defense. Um, can you add in what you were seeing 
both from an operational perspective uh, and maybe also on sort of the, some of these policy considerations about this changing nature of the space domain in the last few years. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Brian. And, and again, uh, like my colleagues have mentioned, thank you to Secure World Foundation for the invite uh, to participate on this on this stellar and esteemed panel uh, to discuss a very important and timely topic. So uh, uh, very much appreciate that, uh, as the rest have mentioned, and also uh, and uh, appreciate Sarah's uh, comments uh, at the opening and those that have been mentioned uh, uh, to this point. Uh, and what I would add, maybe uh, another perspective to all the, the, the spot on statements that have already been made, uh, from an operational perspective, um, is the th is the threat environment itself. And so uh, the way I would look at this, the two bins that I would categorize uh, the evolution and the development of the Space Force and the rationale for it is the combination of our uh, the United States and our allies and partners exceed, uh, uh, increased reliance on space for national prosperity and for security, coupled with, uh, again, an increased uh, growth or a trend uh, in the threat environment that could potentially deny that access. And, and if we go back to a shorter period of history, and, I, and there's always a danger, if you will, of, of trying to uh, oversimplify uh, historical correlations to what you see now, but I think there's an important uh, uh, time period uh, that it's, that's, it's important to understand here. If we go back 30 years to 1991, uh, two seminal events occurred uh, in the same year. Uh, the first was Desert Storm uh, in Iraq, and the second was the collapse of the Soviet Union and ultimately the end of the Cold War. And, and those two events really did contribute to the next 30 years, the culture that had been developed, uh, the perspectives, the paradigm, if you will, of how space contributes to national security and, and how the, what the military's role is uh, in that. Uh, and I would say uh, with the first example, uh, Desert Storm really introduced, as some have been uh, quoted in the past as saying, the first space war, introduced space capabilities into the theater fight, position navigation and timing, military satellite communications, missile warning, uh, and the and the asymmetric advantage that we gained and we witnessed and realized in Desert Storm uh, was largely attributed to those space-based capabilities. And that set us on a course to exponentially grow those capabilities, the demand signal in the Department of Defense in particular uh, was, was exceeding what we could even develop and acquire and, and field. Uh, and so that was the, the world that we grew up in uh, over the last 30 years. And we're at a point now where we do not project or employ our instruments of national power without space. Uh, on the flip side, the second example with, uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, we, we effectively uh, lost a peer competitor that could challenge us and prevent access to the domain. And so while uh, sm maybe smaller uh, threats in terms of jamming and, and, and other um, uh, capabilities or, or operations may have persisted uh, over the past 30 years, at the end of the day, our peer competitor had been lost. So what that effectively meant is that we could acquire, develop, field more high, highly technical, highly capable systems to support theater operations and didn't have to necessarily prioritize the in-domain uh, requirement or, or capabilities to protect those systems um, because that just wasn't there or wasn't as credible or as persistent or prevailing. And what we've seen over the last uh, decade plus, uh, for example, uh, China's direct descent uh, launch in 2007, uh, that's well documented and recorded, and a series of other activities um, the, the threat environment now has begun to increase and mature and become more complex. So ultimately, it's that addition to the operational environment. Uh, and, and, and again, in addition to the four imperatives that Sarah had mentioned, uh, that really give rise to the need to have a separate service uh, that is exclusively designed to develop the doctrine, the capabilities, the professionals that are steeped in understanding the domain and are able to be able to leverage the domain's uh, capabilities and characteristics for, again, national security and prosperity. And the threat environment is probably a, is a central reason for that. Th thank you for that. I, it's a gr great recap of sort of that, that more near history and sort of what the military saw and, and how we've been changing some of the, around some of those capabilities. So, Mir, I want to go back to you. Um, and so now get to sort of the, the, the crux of the, the question we're trying to get to this panel. Um, you've been pretty outspoken in recent writings and some of the discussions that the Space Force should move beyond just sort of this support orientation of supporting terrestrial operations. And, and you hinted in that in your original remarks. Can you summarize that argument in, let's say, two minutes or so? You know, why do you think the Space Force needs to look beyond just the traditional supporting role? <laughs> 
Uh, two minutes. Okay. Um, so it took uh, Shaggy Beard uh, uh, nine months to write the capstone, and it's not two pages. But okay. Um, <laughs> so yesterday, if you didn't read, uh, Space Force Guardian Captain uh, Chris Fabian wrote an excellent piece in the Hill. So I would recommend you to for you to read that and look at all the links. So China has proclaimed themselves that they want to become humanity's dominant space power by 2045, um, and ch China is not containing themselves to Leo, right? And they're looking beyond. And uh, so uh, that is something that should concern us. That should also be something that have, should have a chilling effect on how we are calculating. Uh, because we saw, we see on earth, uh, around the planet, how they behave, right? The extermination of Uyghur Muslims, uh, the uh, Hong Kong protests, the harassment of China, the COVID pandemic cover up and so forth. And then also in space, we saw that uh, and, and things have changed, and, and I've seen their behavior change for, for the better. We saw their reckless uh, 2007 ASAT test. We have debris still orbiting uh, until 2027 or so, right? Um, and while they're still interested in LEO, they are now looking beyond LEO, and they're integrating commercial and civil technologies into their national security system, uh, enterprise, and they are set their targets on GEO and XGEO. And as was mentioned, XGEO has been coined as a cislunar uh, area of operation, right? And so that's an important piece to think about. Um, and, you know, I like this terminology. We, we, we hear blue water, brown water, but I like this terminology that Coast Guard Captain Mike Sinclair coined earlier on last year called look down space infrastructure, right? Which provides us everything, PNT, geospatial imagery, uh, communications, and also other sort of non-security non uh, related things like weather, aviation control, maritime traffic, even wildlife traffic, uh, trafficking control, um, and then climate and earth science research, right? Today, the DOD is very focused, and as it should, on look down operations, right? And defense of our uh, United States space assets that facilitate those operations, right? We cannot, do, we cannot stop doing that. We should not stop doing that. This is starting, but the idea, the idea is starting to become more encompassive and, and inclusive. And we see some uh, evolvements in that. And we yesterday or today, AFRL uh, released a primer on the cis lunar, right? And so we are we need to start looking at that. We need to start planning for that because um, if, if we're not there right now, I know the argument is always, "Hey, we're not there right now." But guess what? The Chinese are planning and they're building, and they will be there. And then we're going to be looking like fools without proper planning, right? So we will have to have the capabilities to. Um, protect our look down uh, infrastructure, but at the same time, we need to start looking at what is needed for look up national security space operations. We need to start looking at what acquisition uh, um, authorities need to be uh, made more flexible. We need to have a gap analysis. We need to start thinking up corresponding um, closing of um, operational authorities to address that, right? So we can have that full spectrum capability. And also most importantly, we, as, as a national security person, I'm concerned because I don't want uh, the Chinese government having unilateral dominion and control and holding my critical capabilities at risk, whether it's the look, look down capabilities or the look out and up capabilities, right? So that's, that's the important piece that I think we need to be looking at. Um, and so one of the things that we you know we we uh, like to think about is, and, and I'll compare this to a, you know, we've been talking some history, is um, how, our highways were built, right? And so, you know, in the same way, President Eisenhower um, had had the foresight to do look out development of our interstate highway, even before there were enough cars and trucks to utilize them, right? We we must invest in the same way to secure a space infrastructure today, to because we know it will be there, right? Everybody's looking at the economic projections, and so that is what China is doing, and that that is what we really haven't started yet, right? And we need to start thinking about it. And for example, space uh, systems need to be part of the 17, 16 plus uh, space need to become part of the 17 critical infrastructures that DHS lists, right? Um, I would say, I would end with this, that if Eisenhower would be alive today, and I wish he were, um, he would totally support developing the uh, space highway system of tomorrow, right? Just as the interstate highway knitted us together um, and introduced our country to each other, uh, we can introduce humanity to each other, but it really needs to be who will build that infrastructure and who will be in control of that infrastructure. And if we are not, then we relegate that to uh, China. And, and that is where we're at right now.
Great. Thank you for that. Um, so, so Plavit, I want to turn to you now. You've recently written a book on space strategy that argued essentially the other side of this issue, that, that space is likely to remain largely a support function. Can you, can you summarize that argument in, in a couple of minutes? Uh, yeah, thanks for condensing eight years worth of work into two minutes. Um, well, yeah, well, look, so the analogy I book, push right? in my book uh, is <laughs> the analogy I push in my book is that we have to see Earth a bit more of a coastline and uh, concepts of blue water sea power that a lot of people like to use about military space thinking and strategy that sort of fits more with what may or may not one day happen with interplanetary space but when we talk about um, satellites in earth orbit the coastal mindset is really the the best one to think because it really is about infrastructure and support of needs on earth you know military civilian economic commercial security intelligence the lot um but even in earth orbit though um i, I would disagree with that interpretation at the start there that it's um or, or rather the implication with the poll at the start of this panel that it's either or it's it's not um support versus combat as we know in earth orbit um combat and support operations have a long history uh, in 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 space and in, in earth orbit so even in that environment in coastal operations it it doesn't um exclude milit uh, you know offensive or warfare operations um and 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 not just logistics so so both do happen but the way we approach um space power is about the influence of that environment on the terrestrial environments, land, sea, and air, um, and and if you can't use that infrastructure, or if the use or non-use of orbital infrastructure of space makes no difference on Earth, and there's no point waging space warfare in the first place. The same with the Navy, the same with the air. There's no point just doing stuff in their own environments for their own reasons if it has absolutely no impact on what goes on the ground. So conceptually, that's the starting point. It's about the use and the influence you gain from that medium. Battle is a means, not an end. So continually seeking battle is not necessarily the right mindset. So when thinking about space culture and, and um, you know, new space services or more, what units within military forces around the world now are doing space for me it's the logistics mindset is where you start and then combat operations and thinking has to then support those logistics operations so that's the way around i would argue it and, and it's it's not a one or the other approach but i would keep it to earth orbit and leave says luna to the fantasists thank you for that so um we're gonna uh, turn to uh audience questions here in, in a minute and i see there's already several that have been piling up in there um but one of the ones that, that you just mentioned that one of the audience questions we've, we've gotten in here um is exactly that right that you know we sort of created a bit of a a a, 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 a manufactured choice here between you know one or the other when it really is we kind of have to do both um so Colonel Beard, I'll turn to you now. It is you know because you were part of the team that wrote the the space capsule publication for the Space Force. How did you guys approach this issue, and is this where you felt that you know you felt that Space Force had to deal with both? Yeah, no, that, that a great great question, and I would I would continue on with the just the last comment that was made uh, that at no point in time uh, it, part of the team that had drafted this uh, in advance of the service becoming uh, becoming a reality uh, did we parse it out in that. Uh, in that stark of a manner. Um, what we did uh, realize and what we wanted to emphasize in writing this first capstone publication um, were, were three three things, three motivations behind it. And those all, all tie into uh, to answering the question here. Uh, the first was that space power had matured to the point that it warranted its own independent articulation. And that was the first prevailing motivation uh, that, that drove us to this. Uh, the second motivation uh, was that when we were to have a new service, should we have a new service, that that service would need a central document that provided its purpose, its identity, and its culture separate from, but coordinated with and integrated with the other services. Those that joined the Space Force would no longer be Marines, airmen, soldiers, sailors, et cetera. And, and the third motivation, which is, which is equally uh, uh, related, I should say, was that the joint force would also have to understand what the Space Force brings and what space power brings uh, to the joint fight to national security. And, and it's in that framework that uh, uh, that this discussion really kind of started to abound. And we identified in addition to those three cornerstone responsibilities of the service. The first is to preserve freedom of action in the domain. 
The second is to enhance joint lethality. And that's, you could, you could suggest that that's what the space uh, capabilities in military space has been doing for decades. And the third cornerstone responsibilities was to provide independent options. And if you look at that context to this blue versus brown, looking down versus up discussion, it really is a combination of both. We have to first and foremost preserve freedom of action to those capabilities that enable us and provide the, the prosperity and security that we have. And that is an inherently brown water, if you will, dialogue that we have to maintain access to those capabilities which already exist and which might be threatened and potentially could be removed uh, in, in a detrimental fashion. Um, and at the same time, though, we do put hooks in the capstone publication in the doctrine that speaks to cis lunar ex geo with the anticipation that national interests national objectives would expand beyond uh, geocentric the geocentric orbit and that the concept of preserving freedom of action providing independent options they are not contained to a specific geo geolocation or geocentric location if you will uh, or, or orbit uh, regime uh, and so those requirements that cornerstone responsibilities would expand as national interests expand and that the military would have a role uh, pervasively to be able to provide those no matter where we are. Um, but I would also say, regardless of when and when and where that happens, the fundamental premise of defense and space power and combat power in the domain has to also and always remain uh, in our geocentric regime, which is providing support to terrestrial operations. Um, but again, we are not limited to that. Uh, should we expand uh, the military and the Space Force in particular, must be on guard and on call to be able to provide that and continue that support, freedom of action beyond. Great, thank you for that. So, Caitlin, I'll turn to you and sort of get your thoughts on this. And in particular, to me, one of the issues with doing both is that creates some resource challenges, uh, particularly on the budgeting side. So, so how do you see this and, and what do you think some of the challenges are in working through this? That is exactly what I was going to say. So it's not a one or the other approach. However, in the current state of um, you know our resource constrained environment, and in the future, looking at a further resource constrained environment, we're going to have to make tough decisions, not to eliminate the great capability that we already have, but decisions on what to further invest in. And as Sarah said at the beginning, the Space Force has incredible opportunity and responsibility in promoting commercial space, in starting and investing in new technologies and in new missions. And so that's kind of where this resource issue plays in. You know, I don't think there are, yeah, I think there are pros and cons to this debate on all sides. Um, what I'm really excited about is that having this debate in open forums like this is causing further research, deeper discussion, and even more study and, and getting attention onto the issue and smart minds thinking about it will help, help us make more informed and, and technically informed policy. So not just, you know, what we can dream of and throwing in, you know, Star Wars and Space Trek references, but really what are we physically capable of and where is the conversation leading us while keeping in mind that we can't just posture ourselves against what we think our adversaries are, uh, adversaries are doing. We must do what will protect and support you know, our troops and um, our capabilities and our national security at home. Thank you. Um, Mir, I, I want to pull up a, a, one of the audience questions here um, and, and sort of and sort of get your reaction to it. And it's something that I wonder myself. And that's, you know, you mentioned that China has talked about dominating space and becoming sort of the global space power of the next, I think, about 2050. But the U.S. has also talked about that dating back for a few decades now and has had U.S. policies or doctrine statements from the U.S. military talking about space dominance, space superiority. How, you know, how much do you think that maybe China's thinking on this was influenced by prior U.S. thinking? And are they both approaching the same way or, or should we, should we, is China really thinking about it differently than the way U.S. has in the past? Yeah, Brian, that's a great point. Let me just also reiterate, I'm a uh, violent agreement with Casey Beard. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think, I think the document uh, had a great, like he said, uh, stepping stone for expansion, right, into the, the blue water 
uh, sort of space aspects. So once we get there, we will be able to expand. So I think that was an important aspect that I was very happy to see in the capstone. That, so they, they, when we talk about a domination, right? Nobody can dominate space. Like I had a conversation a couple of days ago with someone about Lagrange points. Like you, they're as big as the Mediterranean Ocean. Like how are you going to dominate the entire Mediterranean Ocean, right? Uh, even physically on Earth, it's not that easy to do, right? So we're not talking about dominating space. What we're talking about is different things. And like you said, uh, China's really smart move of the Beidou system, right? The alternative to GPS. Who they can, who are they bringing on board for that? Uh, is is it's very shrewd. It's very smart. It's something uh, straight out of our playbook, right? But they are making sure that there's no dependency on the U.S. They are making sure that the little coalition or the big coalition that they're building, there's no dependency on the U.S. And that then, if they wanted to, they could tap in and get uh, national security or intelligence information from that system, right? Uh, the belts and roads uh, process, right? It's it's some, something very similar to the Marshall Plan, but different, right? Uh, and so they are doing that, and and they should be doing that. If I was in China and I was advising the Chinese leadership, I was Chinese, I would, I would tell them do that. What are we doing, right? So what what I'm saying is that the uh, industry, right, the the commercial industry is being dominated by China, right? The the uh, um, aggressive manner in which they are making sure our companies are being driven out of business where they dis, uh, where they de factor and they dis disband and they send our our production lines overseas uh similar to what happened with solar panels right the us has uh, create another mass producer of solar panels we're dependent on them these are ways where they dominate so they dominate in that aspect right the us really uh, doesn't have a problem the us military doesn't have a problem of uh, dominance, right? The Navy's goal is to always be dominant, and the Navy is going to be much more robust about it than the Air Force. Air Force talks about air superiority. I'm, I'm pushing for, hey, we need space supremacy, right? There's a big difference between dominance and, and supremacy and superiority, right? Superiority, hey, any, any day one group can win, right? Supremacy at a specific lo location, at a specific time, you will win. But when we dominate, the Navy dominates, they will dominate at any time, any location, anywhere on the earth. They will dominate. That's their goal. Whether they do or not is a different discussion. And so when we talk about the U.S. being a dominant military force in space, that is what I mean. Uh, but the Chinese are looking at it. They're going to they're going to be dominate from the civil side. Right. They're going to create a, a, a very unique uh, ecosystem where everybody wants to be part of that system. Uh, they're going to uh, upgrade their military capabilities so that they can do things that uh, we can't legally yet do, right? Because there's restrictions. Um, they, uh, they, the Space Force just signed the MOU with NASA, right? This is a first time. This is a great start. But there are certain things our government cannot do. We're, we're bound. And then, of course, it's the um, overall, the national idea of what's going on, right? What, 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 what do Chinese people as a whole want and what do we want? As a whole, so that is that is the importance of uh, when we talk about dominance, and I think the Chinese are working towards that. We just need to sort of wake up and see whether that is what we want to do. Yeah, thank you for that. So, so Caitlin, I'll turn to you, Caitlin, and then and then Blood, then to see you know what your thoughts were on this this sort of same question of how to view the issue of dominance. Sure. Well, Brian, as you mentioned earlier, you know our organization CSIS writes a space threat assessment every year in tandem with Secure Worlds global counter space assessment. And in this research, we look at the language directly coming out of uh, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, India, the United States. And, and between that research and, and continual research, um, the language is not much different from the US and China. I think you can talk about intentions. Um, obviously, Chinese public released information is much more controlled than here in the in the United States. I mean, someone could be watching this right now and, and hear what, you know, Colonel Beard is saying, what we're all saying, and, and take that as um, U.S. policy or U.S. Uh, movement and policy. Um, but also, we need to think about what the impact of the United States roles, responsibilities, and communications are on our allies as well as our adversaries. After the U.S. stood up the Space Force um, and the Space Command, we saw a ripple effect across our allies. Um, the U.K. has has stood up um, their own space uh, military force, so has France. 
um, and there are significant investments in uh, in space and space organi organizations um, across uh, Europe, but also from uh, NATO. And so I think you know we need to be careful about how we how we communicate and posture ourselves, um, not just looking at what China and Russia are, are doing and saying and thinking, but also what are our allies investing in and what kind of direction are they taking from us? Well, uh, yes, so uh, I, I think uh, when it comes to the question of um, uh, doctrine and language, um, I, I guess um, to, to Americans, I'd say, well, there's the, you know, there's no better uh, flattery than an imitation, and uh, the Chinese are learning from the best at military space, and that is you, the United States. And there is, a, you know, and there's been studies that's done on this, showing, you know, the remarkable similarities in the learning that a lot of the People's Liberation Army have gone through in thinking about military space uh, operation. So, so the language, um, you know. Is, is in many ways deliberately uh, similar and also because they, they are learning from similar sorts of strategic concepts um you know from from military theory um and then uh, i think in terms of thinking more broadly about what china is doing in space i think there has to be a bit more caution and uh, i guess i put a bit of brakes on some of the more um sort of space racy uh, arguments um that, that we've heard um in that i think it's worth bearing in mind that china has spent the last 30 years investing so much money in its massive array of military and civilian space infrastructure to try and get to almost where the United States was in the mid 1990s you know that sort of which china is now today in in the bulk of its space infrastructure now there are some targeted areas like space weapons where of course the Ch chinese do have a lot uh, more capabilities than the united states did in the 1990s but china has been in catch up modes and um also if you look at a lot of documentation from china on its exploration plans in you know on the moon and perhaps deep space probes um you know, the deadlines are always optimistic. The same as they are in the United States and Europe and Russia. Everybody likes having those diagrams and the dates that are never met. Um, you know, in the year 2000, China was saying that it was going to have boots on the moon in 2020. You know, it's 2021 and they're just putting up their long term space station into orbit. So I think we have to be a bit more careful in terms of thinking, oh, China's going to take over, says Luna tomorrow. And, and we have to stop seeing um, all scientific and exploration activities as inherently dangerous and a threat as well, um, because that's not how the United States would like to see its Artemis program as. Um, you know, even though there may well be some military involvement and, you know, the Space Force is talking about cis lunar operations. Um, um, you know, that's the sort of language that China will jump on in the same way that a lot of American analysts jump on any sort of PLA involvement um, in any kind of space activity um, uh, with the Chinese that are not necessarily threats, like the space station, for example. Mm. So there has to, so there's a lot of mirror imaging and there's a lot of similar sort of action and reaction going on on both sides here. Um, but also it's worth remembering that the cis lunar environment really is not politically sorry is not militarily or economically significant today and probably will not be for a very long time um especially when getting orbital infrastructure to work for real important uh, issues uh, real important needs here on earth is still something that's quite difficult to do and quite temperamental i mean how is gps3 rollout coming along <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's that's been quite an interesting discussion. Uh, so, Colonel Barrett, I'm not going to ask you to comment on GPS three specifically. Uh, I, I do want to pull up another question that the, from the audience here um, sure. and, and touch on something we mentioned a few minutes ago, and that's sort of the role of commercial in this. Uh, and so, the question is, what is the U.S. Space Force's role in terms of fostering commercial in space activities? How is it you guys are seeing that? Is it, is it part of this? equation of increasing you know american space power that that we talked about a little bit earlier uh yes uh, another great question um and i would say uh broadly and many of you probably have heard general raymond uh, say very similar comments that the, the space force from the get-go uh, is built to be innovative um agile fast and future looking and so we are really looking at everything that we can with an open canvas uh, i would say uh, that as the, the Space Force continues to mature and our presence continues to expand and, and adjust uh, to meet the needs of the nation and, and the support of our allies and, and really to, to contribute to uh, a safe, secure, uh, accessible space domain, um, we're also partnering very closely with the commercial sector. And I believe that there's a, a, a symbiotic relationship 
uh, between both, that we can uh, continue to seek some of the great technology, learning, innovation that's being done in the commercial sector, which where in fact, it, it might be even exceeding the DOD. You know, we've seen a, an inflection point uh, over the last couple of decades where the DOD has largely been the, the leader of technology uh, and, and, and fielding of that technology. And, and, and in this case, now the commercial sector really has the preponderance of that. And so we have already uh, established uh, several connections and bonds uh, with our commercial partners uh, to understand and leverage some of the, the approaches they take uh, in the digital transformation that you've probably heard uh, several times uh, that the Space Force is trying to undertake to get us more into the 21st century and beyond. Um, from that to, to infrastructure to just other technologies that could be fielded uh, to continue to provide robust capabilities uh, for what we need here on Earth. Uh, and beyond. So I, I think the growth is absolutely there. In fact, I know it is. Uh, and there's evidence uh, throughout just the first year and a half of our existence. And I s absolutely see a continued growth in that relationship, more formalized growth uh, going forward. Um, and as a, if I could, before I, before I step off too, I'd also like to uh, uh, contribute or add more to what Caitlin had mentioned previously about also the need to partner with our allies. Um, this is not go it alone. Um, this, the, the, objective of being able to maintain the security accessibility requires uh, a, a team approach, whether it's commercial, allies, partners, et cetera. Uh, and so that is absolutely where the Space Force is focused. Uh, and we're already seeing the benefits of, it, benefits of that at this point. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Uh, Mir, you, you wanted to chime in on this question as well? Yeah, and I think this is the, the one of the important pieces, right? I mean, the, one of the reasons for the creation of the Space Force was to help with the whole procurement acquisition process. So. Uh, the fact that uh, the Space Force is, uh, you know, doing that is an important aspect too. Don't forget that it's uh, while, you know, the, the, the major primes have always been the backbone of a lot of the heavy lift, the innovation really lies in the smaller companies and we need to find ways. I This uh, COVID year, I was at home giving free advice to, you know, as a government guy, I can't, you know, take money for this, but I was giving free advice to a lot of startups. And I will tell you uh, how much time I would spend with people from the CEO down to their finance people saying, we are baffled by how this process works. It's not just space uh, acquisition and processes, but others. We need to find a way to uh, streamline that, really find a way to streamline that uh, because there are some amazing capabilities out there that are not integrated too. The other part that's not uh, really looked at upon that much is how we are leveraging commercial um, when it's, it's, it's an idea that's not currently in the architecture. It is currently not something that we have uh, imagined. And getting that in there so that that becomes a requirement for future planning, that's an important aspect. So I've met, talked to companies where I'm like, have you talked to General Raymond? They're like, um, no. And, and, you know, and there's a reason why he's not, they're not talking to General Raymond. But the idea that this needs somehow to be incorporated into the imagination of the service so that then they can say, we are looking for stuff like this. Can you uh, approach us if you have this? That's, that is an important piece. And then lastly, I want to just uh, clarify, maybe I, I misspoke. But when I talk about space power, I'm not talking about militarization, right? I'm talking about the, the national instruments of power and how we project all, that power into space. And so just like the Food and Drug Administration is part of our national security, as we witnessed in this COVID year, the same thing is happening with NASA, right, and space. So they are part of the, the national security calculus and space power. Um, and so the DOD really uh, must um, uh, return to some of their historical roots in going back into commercial, going back to supporting civil like we did in the 50s and 60s. I mean, the president mentioned that he wants to create a DARPA-like uh, agency for science uh, during the State of the Union. So these are things that we need to start feeling comfortable with. I know it's maybe it's uncomfortable for some people, but we need to start feeling comfortable with. Thank you. Yeah, the, you know, it's, a, it's an excellent point. And, 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 and that's a difficult thing to try and balance, right? How do we, how do we integrate all that stuff without sort of the military sort of, the military aspect sort of taking over all those other things? Right and 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 you know NASA now being pursued perceived as potentially a, a military entity or, or being a role, having a role with that I think that's um, that, that that's that's an interesting question so um, uh, there's another question on the chat I, I want to uh, bring up real quickly um, as we're sort of moving the last you know few minutes here um, and and Bledna I was 
I was thinking maybe you could give a kind of a quick answer to this. And the question is, you know, how can the U.S. use the words like space supremacy, dominance, while at the same time talk about norms of behavior, which something has been a big talking point for the U.S. military the last several years? Thanks. Uh, yeah. So in terms of squaring this circle, um, I draw a distinction between uh, words like dominance and supremacy. Um, they they really are more about military doctrine and, uh, and strategy and what you want to achieve in a time of open hostilities and conflict versus um, international cooperation and norms and rules of the road is, is something that you want to do, you know, in a, in a, with an absence of 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 of, of, of hope, open hostilities, um, therefore, um, when um, uh, the United States Space Force will talk about denying the use of space for to adversaries, it doesn't mean denying the use of that environment in a time other than war. In the same way that the U.S. Navy talks about dominating particular um, uh, sea lines of communications and particular oceans in the event of open conflict, but during peacetime, it ensures. Um, uh, safe passage of, of all legal uh, traffic. So, so that's the distinction I make, and I don't see a contradiction there because rules of the road, things like that, are, are, are really more about everyday governance um, in times other than open warfare. So, so that's that's how I would square that circle in the language that we see coming out of these different parts of not just the U.S. government, but many of the United States allies and also some other states mm -hmm. as well today. Yep. Great. Thank you. That's a good. Great point. So um, as we wrap up here, I want to give one last question I'd like sort of each of you to, to chime in on. And that's sort of, you know, it, as we as the Space Force and the U.S. government in general continues to ponder this question of, you know, what what does military space look like going forward? Um, you know, give you an opportunity to pick up sort of maybe one challenge you think we should really think about as we go through that. Uh, whether it's, it's it's resources, this is the policy, is it legal implications, whatever else, you know, and, and you know, maybe, you know, a minute or so each as we sort of, you know, one final roundup before we wrap up that. Um, uh, Mir, do you want to start? And then we'll go around. So I think uh, the issue that I'd like to uh, stress is what we don't have and what we need, and we are constrained by the way our government works, you know, the election cycles, the, the fiscal cycles and all that, is we really need a national uh, space vision uh, Bruce Kay and I wrote about it uh, a while back in a report for DIU and AFRL and Space Force. But I think we need to have that. The second piece that I would really talk about is we need to talk about uh, how, why, and when we should classify space systems as uh, critical infrastructure, right? Uh, the debate uh, is, is, is rife right now. There's, there's uh, legislation pending uh, in, in Congress about that. And we need to start thinking about that because that will drive how we protect our look down space systems, but also start planning our uh, reliance and our and our future capabilities of look the look out piece of uh, space infrastructure and systems. So I think that is the, the major piece I would want everybody to leave with. And we should and we can to do both. We can look down and look up and about. So I think that is something that I want to leave everybody with. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. Thanks, Brian. Um, you mentioned a lot of challenges. Obviously, we kind of talked about the resource one earlier, so I want to pick something different. And I think that is the challenge of integrating commercial capabilities that already exist into our services architecture and using them um, actively in missions while balancing the security aspect of using commercial services and software. So making sure that um, you know, as we know, military, U.S. military satellites are highly protected um, from attack, but commercial services might not be in the same way. And so how do you um, impact these requirements without um, stifling innovation or putting too much burden on commercial industry? But if I think if commercial industry really wants to make that impact and, and have the government as a customer and as a reliable customer, they do also need to think about adopting a lot of the, um, you know, best defenses or protections um, in the case of a conflict or attack or in a, operating in a denied environment. Yeah, and of course, in doing so, what does that do for their cost and their business model? And that, that, that itself is a hugely complicated subject. So, Blethyn, I'll turn to you. 
Uh, thanks. Uh, so I think the most interesting thing I'll, I'll be watching in the years ahead with military space in the US is the evolution of, of, of uh, the culture in the US Space Force. Uh, so uh, as Sarah said at the very start, uh, the, the Space Force is inheriting a lot from the US Air Force, both in terms of actual personnel, but in terms of procedures, institutions, and what it's done as a, as a US Air Force um, part for the past uh, 60 years or so. Um, and But also in, in space, what is interesting to see what could develop is will there be a greater emphasis on prestige roles given towards what is effectively a logistics job you know logistics and IT support to keeping US terrestrial forces active and efficient and working um, whether or not the space environment itself is uh, degraded or not because in space you know space as we know it today we don't really need the top gun flyboy jocks we don't need the big gunners we don't need the flashy naval captains you you, you need the engineers you need the logisticians you need the computer geeks so those are the people you know will they see a proper home in a culture in the u.s space force so i'll be keeping a, a close eye on how that turns out in the years to come yeah and to that point you know there was a recently a statement about the the Space Force brands those the digital service and sort of trying to attract some of those exact skill sets. So, sorry, Colonel Beard, over to you for the for the final word. Yeah, Brian, thanks. Uh, great, uh, great points. All legitimate challenges, uh, all that that we are facing in here. I uh, I don't have necessarily anything new, but I want to maybe add a, a small uh, tweak to those. Uh, first, I'll start off on the comment that, or the question that had been asked at the very end. And, and Blood, and I completely agree with his comment that the concept of norms of behavior and the need to attain space superiority or supremacy are not contradictory to one another. In fact, in many ways they're complementary. And, and I think one side benefit or one important benefit of it is being able to establish norms. How we get there is, is really the challenge, but the, need, the, uh, the benefit of those is that you can identify and all can identify an agreed upon set of bad behaviors or unwanted behaviors that could trigger uh, further deterrence or if necessary, defeat mechanisms. Uh, and in the absence of that, that creates the challenge. What are the ROEs? Uh, who is in the right and who is in the wrong in that, if you will, if you want to put it in those terms. So the, the ability to attain norms of behavior in this, uh, in this domain uh, is going to be a challenge, but one that we absolutely have to pursue if we're to be perfective in, in defense of it um, and, and uh, prosperity of it. The, the other pieces on the, on the resources, uh, resourcing of it, it really is in the context of the DOD writ large. So now that we have a new service, a year and a half in existence, what is the prioritization scheme? How does the space force itself fit into the rest of the joint force? And there will be trade-offs in strength, budget lines, et cetera, all those challenges that we know. And how does the joint force uh, and, and how does the space force integrate into the rest of the uh, services and armed forces from a prioritization standpoint to be able to get the resources it needs and understand that those trade-offs might have to be made with the more established services uh, who've been doing this for a while. Uh, and lastly, uh, I just do want to reiterate the point that, that Mir had mentioned about classification. Um, uh, highly classified business, highly classified world, uh, and we're not able to talk a lot about it. And I know that's always uh, creates intrigue and, and mystery behind it. Uh, but but collectively going forward, we need to have the right balance of what we can talk about, what we need to talk about to continue to advocate uh, to solve these challenges and, of course, maintain the, the security that we might need to uh, like we do in any other domain. Uh, and I would I would say those are the three. Most of those have already been mentioned, but I but I agree wholeheartedly with those. And all thanks. Right, well, thank you as well. Thank you to all of you for a great discussion. I uh, wish we had an audience here, person to give you the round of applause you all deserve. Uh, but with that, uh, we'll wrap this up um, and I'll turn it back over to Crystal to introduce our second keynote speaker.